Hello and welcome to FACT's webinar called Raising Pastured Poultry During a Highly Pathogenic Avian Influenza Outbreak. Our presenter today is Mike Badger from the American Pastured Poultry Producers Association, or APA. I am Larissa McKenna, FACT's Humane Farming Program Director, and I will be moderating the session. Thank you all for joining us. Let me just take a minute or two for a few quick introductions. Uh, Food Animal Concerns Trust or FACT. We are a national nonprofit organization. We're headquartered in Illinois. We work, do work all across the country. Uh, and we work to ensure that all food producing animals are raised in a healthy and humane manner. We accomplish this by supporting humane farmers, promoting policies that make food from animals safe and healthy to eat, and by helping consumers make informed food choices. Uh, along with my colleague, Samantha, I run FACT's Humane Farming Program, which works with livestock and poultry farmers from all across the country. We offer grants, scholarships, personalized materials, mentorship, and of course, webinars on many topics. Uh, I invite you to visit our website at foodanimalconcernstrust.org to learn more about all of these opportunities and um, upcoming services. This time, I'm very pleased to introduce our Awesome esteemed presenter, Mike Badger. Mike is the director of the American Pastured Poultry Producers Association, or APA. Uh, along with his family, he also operates Badger's Millside Farm in Pennsylvania. So we're super lucky to have him with us today to talk about this timely topic of interest. Um, and I think without further ado, Mike, I'm going to pass the floor over to you. So take it away. Okay, well, thank you, Larissa, for, for having uh, me and, and asking me to come on here and, and share some insights about uh, high path AI, hopefully some insights and uh, for supporting APA, do, do appreciate it. I'll go ahead and share my screen here. And we'll get started. Okay, so hopefully everybody's seeing that. Uh, so as Larissa mentioned, we're gonna talk about uh, raising pasture poultry during an avian influenza outbreak. Uh, all you here, all you folks are here today because it's kind of like all the rage in poultry circles, right? Um, the, the news goes out and it's, you know, we live in a 24 hour news cycle where everything we have is instantaneous. And sometimes you just aren't sure where to go and what to do. And, uh, cause there's a lot of conflicting information. I am going to hopefully accomplish a couple of things during this talk, most people want to know the details, like how do I know if I have avian influenza in my flock? What do I do about it? And how do I keep my flock safe? We'll get there. Um, but I want to step back and actually evaluate the risk because I think the risk of this is very important. And we'll look at historical data. We we'll look at USDA's data. We'll look at USDA's analysis primarily in 2015, which was their last major outbreak. And we'll use that to inform our perceptions and our, our actions and, and what we think and what we do. So I will say right at the very beginning, and I'll probably say this again if it comes up, but to make sure it's clear, everybody who has chickens right now is at risk, okay? It, we're talking about a virus that affects poultry, you know, specifically chickens and turkeys. So you have risk. Uh, the question I want you to think about as we go through here is how much risk do you actually have as a pastured poultry producer? And I'm going to be speaking primarily through the lens of pastured poultry today. Uh, pastured poultry, briefly, in the context of this conversation, I mean birds that are primarily raised outside on pasture for majority of their life. And, and that means vegetative pasture, right? Something with roots. It's typically green and most times of the year. Um, and then there's a rotation to it. There's most of the time it's a mobile environment. And so the birds are constantly moving. Uh, this time of year where I'm at in Pennsylvania, I have laying hens right now. They are not on pasture. They're, they're actually in their, their winter housing. Um, we'll talk a little bit about some of those differences and when we get further along in the, the webinar. So I just wanna be clear that there is a risk. The question I want you to think about is, what is that risk? And we'll use real world information, facts, as they say, to 
make that risk analysis. And then we'll talk about what we can do as pasture poultry producers to protect ourselves and our investments and sometimes our livelihood, right? I, I, I was looking at some of the names on the webinar. There's some livelihoods tied to this, this webinar today. And so as not to be taken lightly, but I am generally of the opinion that the mainstream marketing of this um, virus, this, this event is largely out of whack with reality to, to what we see. Uh, the, the, the rhetoric being pushed back at you know, non-commercial producers is generally not balanced with, with the historical fact. Um, so anyway, that's where we're gonna start. We'll run through some stuff. I'll pause as we go for questions. So put it in the Q&A box when you have it. Uh, otherwise we'll leave some time at the end to, to pick up anything that I missed. Here's what we're gonna talk about. The problems, the risks. I think risk is a, is a big word. Um, we all have it. We need, to, we need to come to grips with this term of risk. Um, talk about the B word, which of course is biosecurity. And when we get there, I'm gonna kind of promote a, a more holistic approach to, to raising your birds out on pasture. Because I'll, I'll say, I don't, the folks that I know that, doing, that are raising pasture poultry, I believe are raising pasture poultry because they believe that they're raising birds in a better manner. They, they believe that they have an advantage in the health and the welfare and of, of the bird and the environment and the people who eat them, right? So, so the question I think you have to ask yourself if you are raising pasture poultry in the way that I described a minute or two ago is how much does avian influenza knock you off of your, your game, knock you off of your perspective that pasture poultry has clear advantages in the health and well-being of your of the flock, um, I think that's a powerful mindset. It, it's one I I rely on. I I think pasture poultry has an advantage, and I think the advantage shines through in this this case. And we'll we'll talk about that as we go. So here's where we're at as of you know yesterday when I pulled these numbers off of USDA's detection website. Um, I put the source here. You can just Google some of this stuff and find it pretty easily too. But right now we got about six backyard sites and seven commercial um, up and down the East Coast here. We got, and I think Midwest, we got one or two. Um, so pretty even split so far, but in terms of numbers, like actual numbers, it's not even close. You know, the, the backyard numbers will be less than a percent of the total sick birds. and. And the, the distinction here, so we don't really know what those backyard birds are. You know, they could be somebody with, you know, 12 chickens that let them run around in a pond um, or run, you know, drink from the pond. It, more than likely, to my knowledge, hasn't been any, any pastured flocks that have been affected with avian influenza in this outbreak or in 2015. Um, so we really don't know what back, the backyard flock means or what kind of housing environment they're in, husbandry, we don't know anything. Commercial ones, we, we all know what they are. They're intensely confined um, chickens. And this, this disease historically has, has really wreaked havoc on turkeys uh, and laying hens, and it occasionally picks up some broilers. So we talked about this in my opening. Are you at risk? Short answer is yes. So then what is highly pathogenic avian influenza? Primarily, you look at it, and if, let me go back here. I'm, I skipped the wild bird surveillance. So one of the things that USDA APHIS does the, is they, they surveil the wild duck population and test it routinely. And right now, they have a, about 300 detections that they've, they've been monitoring here this year. And that's when I talked with Dr. Wood from USDA on my podcast here, I asked her if there's any correlation in, in what she saw with surveillance data to the potential of outbreaks. And uh, she wasn't really able to give me any. There wasn't, didn't sound like there was, was a correlation, but just know that, that an ongoing 
there's ongoing effort with USDA to monitor uh, the, the waterfowl populations. And they do that in a variety of ways. Some of it's through hunters, some of it's just through other detections, monitoring activities, but they, they are looking for it. They're actively seeking out um, instances of, of highly pathogenic avian influenza. And that includes, you know, in, in most states have surveillance programs and, and flocks that move for commerce um, and especially across state lines. So they're, they're constantly looking for this, this virus among, among other things. So avian influenza most commonly gets blamed on the ducks, right? Ducks are the carriers and it doesn't really affect the, the wild ducks too much. Um, and it's secreted in their manure and that manure comes in contact with your birds. That's the infection point, the primary infection point. So it affects domestic poultry. Like I said, turkeys, laying hens, have have seen the brunt of the of the impact, at least in the commercial flocks. Um, you know, in 2015, I know there was a a, a game fowl farm of 5,000 that was counted as backyard flocks that was affected. It's highly contagious, so this is part of the problem with it when it when when birds do get it infected with it, and they're in close contact with one another, they're going to spread it. There, it's, it's a, it's a, that's how, that's how they do it. It's, it's a contact kind of spread. Um, and the intense confinement environments of a commercial poultry barn are not favorable here. Um, so it's highly contagious. It does mutate, does change like a virus, right? We all have some experience now uh, living up close and personal with COVID. We know that the viruses mutate and change. Um, AI is a reportable disease. And so what, what this means is that you're, you're obligated to report it, right? They, you're, you're supposed to report when you have it. But more importantly, with a reportable disease, USDA is gonna come in and take over the, the response to that outbreak or to that, that farm that has a, an infected population of, of birds and you know they'll set up they'll do whatever they do they, they respond to it they they take care of the, the infected flock and they monitor flocks within a certain radius of, of that farm and, and have some control measures there some quarantine some observation some more monitoring but the re, the the response here so if you have a flock of birds and half of them are immediately killed off by the uh, virus, the other half of the, that flock will be killed by the response, right? It, all birds are euthanized, depopulated, slaughtered, killed, whatever, you, whatever nice word you wanna put on it, there are no survivors. Um, either the disease will kill them or the, the feds will kill them. Um, and that's, they say, to stop the spread of disease. The downside there is if you, are a, um, a breeder and you have rare birds, for example, there's, there's no exceptions that I know of. Um, if, if you were to have a, a positive outbreak in your flock and you reported it and you were you know, being responded to, the USDA was coming in to, to respond to that situation, that their only mode of operation is depopulation of the, of the surviving birds. So, not always a nice thing. Um, one of the things I remember in 2015 is there was discussion about how to depopulate large, large barns of birds because um, some of these birds, are, these barns are very, very large and they run out of supplies. You know, sometimes they use foam, sometimes they just shut off all the ventilation and turn off the controls and walk away, and the birds ultimately perish. It's, it's, um, it's the really ugly side of. Of this, in my opinion, um, but there's also a low a, a low path version. It's not as deadly. Um, it doesn't usually cause as much mortality in in the birds, but it can mutate and change from low path to high path given the right circumstances. And what the right circumstances are is not quite 
I'm not, I don't know that exactly, but the, the, the science is pretty clear. It does mutate. <clears throat> and I'm, I live, I sit on a listserv in Pennsylvania here where I get notifications coming out of the state monitoring program. Um, so I see a lot of, a lot of information throughout the year of surveillance topics. Low path AI comes up occasionally in, in ducks and, and other, not necessarily just ducks, but other poultry, especially in live market testing, um, as do some other other diseases. But so it's out there. Mike, this do you is wanna, why. Oh, do you want to take just a? There's a couple of questions that came in that oh. probably are good for this. The last slide. It was. Um, I oh, think yeah. people people just want. Um, to kind of um, <laughs> get more specific about what's considered a wild bird. So ducks, obviously, geese, uh, people are also so, saying um, turkeys, wild turkeys, is that of concern? So wild turkeys, to my knowledge, have not been identified, but wild, wild ducks, like if you look at the detection website that I shared earlier, the, the birds you see on there are like pintails, mallards, um, there's a couple of snow geese instances. Um, I saw some vultures on there. Um, those are the things that are typical. Um, and so, you know, wild ducks, migratory birds is, is another way to think about that. So that's where the emphasis is typically on. Um, and then folks are wondering about the domestic side of the waterfowl, like um, mm. are, are they at risk as other poultry? Again, the you are at risk um, if it's a if it's a poultry species if it's you know it's, it's carried by ducks right the the wild ducks are reservoirs for this meaning they carry it and aren't always affected right so you don't always see visible signs of an infection with the duck so but that doesn't mean that they're not they're 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 immune to it they're they're still susceptible to it your ducks are still susceptible to it whether or not they show it or, or, or have a disease response is something entirely different. Um, whether or not they spread it to other, other sections of your farm is, is entirely different. Um, you know, I don't necessarily talk about this, I don't think in any other spot, I thought it would probably come up as a question, but this good time to think about your flock management. You know, it, it's fun sometimes to have you know, a bunch of birds of multi-species and multi-ages and just let them run around and co-mingle. That's not always the best thing for your, your flock health. You know, I'm, I always promote that, you know, kind of all in all out mentality, especially with, with chickens and layers and keeping everybody at the same age together um, and isolated it helps with some of that disease response and keep species different or keep species separate more importantly. So ducks stay with ducks layers stay with layers, meat chickens stay with meat chickens, et cetera. Um, you know, for the people who are used to raising uh, some of the, the commercial specialized varieties, but does that, does that help? Does that yeah, that's you? great. There's one last kind of like add on is folks are wondering about sparrows or other songbirds. Do they come to play spreading? Yeah, <clears throat> there's, um, I'm thinking back to in 2015, there was an epidemiological report that they basically did a survey of, of some farms in the Midwest that were positive sites. And these, these are linked throughout my presentation. You can find these reports online. Um, they noted that some of the barns had some bird populations inside the barn. Um, I don't know if they were sparrows or not, but that was a risk factor that they were identifying that and so I think there is a risk, how much of one I can't really quantify. You know, if you listen to the industry, any wild bird that ever has wings is a risk to your outdoor flock. Um, and we just know that that's not true. Um, and this is also a good time to, to say that, you know, and I'll reiterate this probably later, but exposure to the virus doesn't mean infection, right? There's nothing in the world that leads us to believe that just because you're exposed to a virus or your or your poultry are exposed to a virus that you will automatically become infected or your birds will become infected. So we'll we'll touch on some of that as we 
as we get closer to the end. Thank you. Ah, so why is this a concern? Um, these are, this is from 2015. This is the, this is the reason that people get um, animated and, you know, start talking about biosecurity and start promoting the things that they do because it has real economic impact. You know, you're looking at billions of dollars, you know, a couple billion dollars in, in 2015 from the from that outbreak. And these are the commercial numbers, right? You saw, everybody knows that you saw the price of eggs surge. Of if you were even trying to buy turkeys as a pasture poultry producer, you saw, you know, some of the turkey markets being a little bit tight and being able to get poults. So the number here, the, the first one, the stat that I have, 12% of the US laying hens on 50 farms, that's a 12% 12 of the laying hens of the, of the entire country were impacted by 50 farms. And I put that in there for two reasons. One, it shows the breadth of the impact, but two, it shows the breadth of consolidation. And I think that's, that's a point that shouldn't be missed in these conversations is we've, we've managed our, com our commercial flocks, our poultry flocks to get to this point, to make it really favorable for, for outbreaks and susceptible to outbreaks. We, we know, know through COVID even that food chains are pretty fragile as it turns out. Same thing with turkeys. You know, that's a little bit better, but man, it's just, it's just crazy. And even though broilers weren't, I think there was one or two farms in 2015 that were broilers, broiler farms, a bunch of countries shut off all imports, including broiler imports from the US. And so huge, huge economic uh, ramifications. And that's why you see the focus on this. And here are some of this summary. We compare this with, with 2022 so far. You know, these, this is where we were. 211 commercial farms tallied 50 million birds. 21 backyard flocks tallied 10,000 birds, um, including one, one backyard flock of 5,000 game birds. And again, the, the classification here of USDA is they don't really go into a lot of great detail. You're either commercial or your backyard. Um, and, in, and in terms of what they would consider pasture poultry, they, they would consider it backyard, right? Because their, their commercial lens seems to be contract grower relationships, right? The, those, big, those big houses. So the question here is, where's the greatest risk? Now, people get upset with me when I, when I bring this out and, and, you know, use numbers. You know, science only matters when it, when it matches your reality. But this is actually observed events. And this is fair. You can research other outbreaks throughout the world. And back in 83 was one of the last biggest ones in the, in the U.S. This, this trend bears itself out. It's commercial farms being affected at a disproportionate rate than anything else. And so when I look at this, my interpretation simply is, yes, I have chickens, I'm at risk. But the primary risk here is not me. Like I'm, I don't have to be, I don't have to panic, right? If, my, if you take one thing away from me today, it's don't panic. So the idea here, then a fraction of those total birds are backyard. If you, have, if you actually run these numbers and you, you calculate the percentage, it's less than a percent. You know, it's uh, like two hundredths of a percent or something like that. It's, it's of, of the total birds, 10,000 out of 50 million. You get the point. Um, and all those, all of these outbreaks right here, these 211 commercial farms, I can tell you what they weren't. They weren't pastured farms and they weren't certified organic farms. Um, I'll, call, I'll add a caveat to that, I guess. We don't know necessarily all the details of all of them, but to my knowledge, during the time, I was trying to find out you know, if they were 
certified organic if they were pasture raised what their what their management style was to my knowledge all the all the management styles were what you'd expect intensely confined commercial production um conventional feed all the whole nine yards right heavily stocked houses and and had and very dense populations of poultry on farm and so that brings up an interesting question for me and and i asked uh, Dr. Chrislyn Wood, when I interviewed her just a couple of weeks ago at the PASA conference, because she's with APHIS, and I asked her about organic flocks, and she didn't have an answer for me. But to me, this suggests that stocking density inside a barn really does matter, and maybe even the feed and, and the other management practices of the birds matters in this in this. Um, event and I'm, I'm drawing some conclusions here based on the information that I have so just know that and same same thing that every one of you can do right you can look at the numbers you can look at the risk and draw some conclusions and, and so I always ask the question what what percentage of these flocks were certified organic and, and does that and the, if it was none what does that tell you should it tell you something I think it should tell you something um, organic flocks even though they're if they're raised can, in confinement have a lighter stocking density than than the other non-organic birds. So anyway, it's fascinating stuff. I think people need to be aware of that before you before you formulate your responses. So here are some interesting words. Um, you can see the source of this. Uh, the, also, the context of, of this. I wanted to share this quickly because um, it it really bolsters the the risk assessment here. Um, in 2015, USDA said or they had to publish a rule that made the contract or the integrators pay their, their contract growers indemnity or you know pay for their birds that got depopulated. So the USDA put that out, and there's a line in there exempting folks from some biosecurity requirements. The, the plan ultimately said you have to have a biosecurity in place that has to have some requirements, but these facilities are exempted. And they were smaller facilities. And the word in here, there's a lot of words. I'll just I'll just read it. In addition, the smaller facilities that we are exempting from the requirements are less likely to have outbreaks than are the non-exempt ones. In smaller facilities, bird density tends to be less, which minimizes overall viral load. Additionally, if a smaller facility was identified with um, avian influenza, the disease is less likely to spread outward to other premises. So, again, I don't. I, it's fine to hear me say that there's less risk. I bring this out because that's USDA saying, hey, there's some farms, you know what, wink, wink, they have less risk. Now, when I, when I found this years ago, I, I beat this drum very hard because the messaging has always been that, that small flocks, non-commercial flocks are the greatest at risk. And by the way, because there's no biosecurity on these small flocks, they're going to make, they're going to put all the larger commercial flocks at risk. And we just know that that's bumpkiss on almost all of those assertions, including the biosecurity one. So, so I think it's important to, to frame this and, and know that I'm not the only one saying this, right? This is, this, this is the uh, USDA. So let's start talking a little bit about the actual virus itself. What is it like? It likes cool, moist environments. It loves intense confinement. Um, I've been reading some stuff here that this is from other outbreaks, other publications, and um, you know, looked at some stuff in, in Europe and Asia and having some other conversations with, with other producers. There's some, there's some thought that genetic uniformity actually contributes to to the spread of this virus um, when it gets when a flock gets infected in it. and so intense confinement I think is the prerequisite and then what role does genetic uniformity play in in the spread of that virus through a flock or how susceptible does it make it I think that's a really great question for us to start thinking about and start asking um, have, have we because we don't know, in these birds, these commercial layers or these commercial turkeys, we don't know the parent stock. We don't know the breeding. We don't know 
all those all the breeding programs are proprietary they're just a trade secret and so you don't know how much uh, diversity there is in those genetics and so i think it's an interesting question to raise and to, to think about now i can't say that one way or the other that it that it is indeed a, a problem but intensive confinement i think the, the numbers are pretty clear um, the usda's own assessment is pretty clear um, intensive confinement is an issue um, the the thing that is unfavorable to this virus is sunlight right this is why this the, uh, the virus hbai will disappear in the summertime right it, it, it will be it's destroyed by uv light by the sunlight and warm temperatures it just doesn't hold up so that's a that's a benefit i think when you start talking about pastured flocks and just kind of the life cycle of this thing Are there any any questions here before, before I move in? Uh, well, there's a comment and it's um, more about, let's see, the percentages you just spoke of speak to density and not husbandry style. There's no less risk to smaller operations. Um, the sheer number of large operations make them look like they have larger risk. Um, I don't know if you'd like to um, react to that or not. Um, so, so I think that's an interesting, that's an interesting assertion. So according to this idea, I'm to believe that there's more commercial turkey farm or commercial poultry farms than there are backyard flocks and pastured flocks um, in sheer numbers, in, in raw, you know, in no numbers. I think that's, I'd have a hard time buying that as a as a as a as a I just have a hard time buying that. I think I don't have numbers to support it. I don't know how many backyard flocks there are, and I don't know how many commercial poultry operations there are off the top of my head, but you know I, backyard poultry is pretty popular right now. Um, there's a lot of it happening. And so in sheer numbers, I, I believe there's more, there's a lot more ton more backyard flocks running around than there are actual commercial flocks. Now, I think the density question there is the density inside the barn. That's the risk. Um, and I think the numbers support that. Um, and someone's asking, so you're saying this won't be a problem during the summer? <laughs> yeah, that's the, that's, the, that's the information I got. That's what happened. That's the way it played out in 2015. Um, I confirmed with uh, Dr. Wood when I interviewed her a couple of weeks ago, and she she also affirmed at that time. Yeah, doesn't like sunlight. Um, and so someone also asked, as a broiler producer, I'm wondering about the risk to the hatchery. Should we expect disruption in the supply of baby chicks this summer? Um, I don't think so. Um, most of the, I would say, buy from a reputable place, which would be, we'll talk about that a little bit later, maybe. Um, but but your commercial hatcheries, like like I buy a lot of stuff through Moyers Chicks, for example, or even Murray McMurray. Um, they all have monitoring programs. They're going to they're gonna be doing H, HPAI screenings as part of their ongoing uh, programs, typically. And so... I'd feel comfortable buying from them. I haven't seen any disruptions yet from, from the supply. Um, so <laughs> a couple more questions about timing. Someone says, do we just have to get through the spring if it disappears in the summer? And then someone else asks, is, does it become an issue again in the, the fall? But, you know, the, the migration yeah. the other way. Yeah. The, so, I think you can think of it probably as, as your bigger risk periods are going to be the fall, winter, and <laughs> spring. Um, but you know, fall starts in September, right? I think if I get my start of my seasons right. But anyway, let, you know that late. That was partially a question. I was <laughs> wasn't being <laughs> flipped there, um, trying to think of my seasons off the top of my head. Um, but you know, I think it's 
realistically, when you look at what happens in the past, it, it's deeper into the fall that might they might pop back up again. Awesome. Um, so there are quite a few more questions coming in. I don't know if you want to, um, since we're talking about some of the symptoms, maybe get through those and see if that answers some folks' questions. Sure. So, so the the thing that everybody wants to to be, I just realized that when we, so I don't have mortality on here. So mortality is your biggest your biggest sign of a, of a problem, right? You come out and you start having sharp mortality, like you know, five, 10, 15, 20% mortality, 50% mortality kind of just comes out of nowhere. Um, that's a, obviously a clear sign that something's wrong. It's a clear sign that something, that something might be high path AI. Um, there's just very high mortality events. Um, you'll, some of the other signs you'll start seeing is a sharp reduction in feed and water consumption. Um, the birds become very quiet, which I didn't actually know about this one until just a, a few weeks ago here when I, when I was talking to USDA. Um, one of the turkey farms that, that just got infected here in 2022, the, the sign that tipped off the grower was um, the birds became quiet. And if you've ever been in a room full of turkeys, you know, they don't, they're not quiet typically. Um, respiratory problems, you know, difficulty breathing, coughing, sneezing, snicking, those kind of things. Some discharge from beak and eyes, difficulty walking. Um, you have a sharp drop in egg production. We were just talking about something like this on the APA list recently, where somebody was trying to troubleshoot um, a sharp drop in egg production. And in this time of year, when we think for us in, in a pasture environment, typically one of the first questions we ask is, how long were they without water? You know, did the water freeze and how long was it before you brought it fresh water back in? But because um, that will also cause a sharp drop in egg production, but nevertheless, so can H, uh, even influenza. You know, swollen combs and wattles, a bluish purple tint, um, swelling around the eyes. These came from uh, Dr. Wood. She was USDA APHIS veterinarian. Um, summarized these on my podcast that we did at PASA. Um, if you haven't listened to that episode, that she's a really great interview. She, she does tout the conventional line of thinking, but she's got really great information and perspectives about it. Um, so these are the, the primary signs. And so the anybody that has chickens, you might be looking at this list and being like, oh my goodness, my chickens have had high path AI for the last 10 years. Um, but not every... <laughs> these system symptoms overlap obviously with a lot of other diseases and so not every sick bird that you find right now has hpai it's kind of like turkeys in this in the fall not every sick turkey has blackhead right so not every chi sick chicken or turkey right now in march or end of february has high path ai um and the only way that you can confirm your, I'll go to the next slide here, maybe, your di diagnosis is via laboratory analysis. And so if you are looking at this list and you say, oh, snap, I think I got a problem. I think it's high path AI. The only way to, to rule that out or to confirm it is to send birds to a diagnostic laboratory. And USDA has this hotline. Your state probably has a hotline that, that's been posted by now. Um, and they have state labs all over in each of the states. So you got to reach out, make contact. You can do it through this hotline number that's here, 866-4-USDA-WS. And they will direct you from there. And you'll have to send some birds to the lab. They'll confirm it or, or rule it out. If they confirm it, then they'll send that specimen to a USDA lab. I think I think it's in the Midwest, Iowa, perhaps, to, to confirm it there. And if it's confirmed, this all happens very quickly, then they'll come back in and take control of the response on your farm for your birds. Um, and that's that's how it's done. And then then you're out of the equation pretty much from that point. <laughs> it's it's out of your hands. 
any any questions there, Larissa, before we see we go on? Um, so question, so if a flock is exposed but do not get sick, are they then a carrier? How do you figure that out? <clears throat> yeah, and we'll talk a little bit about a disease triangle here in a few slides, but um, think about yourself. If, if you are you when you're exposed to a cold virus, does that make you a carrier for the cold? Um, sometimes, you know, the immune system is a really cool thing. It can actually shed um, problems and, and reject viruses that are attacked. It. So I don't think that I would call it a, a virus. That's a good question. I don't know that that's actually really been studied. I, don't, I haven't seen any data or research on that, to be honest with you, but my 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 gut answer is no, it doesn't make you a carrier. It just means you weren't infected, you fought it off. Uh, question about infected laying hens um, that cannot spread the disease to their eggs. Is there any truth to that? Yeah, there's generally, you know, almost every announcement that goes out says that there's no risk to human health, uh, even though the birds are sick. And so that would apply to eating the birds or the eggs that the birds lay, assuming you're gonna cook them. And then let's see if this, there's a, it's more of a comment, but it says, it, it seems like your location proximity to bodies of water would attract, that would attract wild fowl more greatly to increase risk. Um, that That's more of a comment, I think. Um, let's see. Two questions. I have a will a sick bird, one that has shown signs and was sick, recover? That's one question. And then number two, how long will a sick a bird be sick for? <laughs> um, well, that's a good question. Hopefully, I mean, if it, I'd say if it doesn't die within the first few days, then you're it'll recover. Um, <laughs> I, I I don't know. I mean, you're without knowing whether or not the bird was, there's, there's an undertone to this question, right? That is, I have a sick bird, but I'm not gonna report it. <laughs> um, how long will it recover? Um, chances are it could more than likely be a, a couple of weeks and it's probably back in, you know, back in, in business. Um, otherwise it tends to die pretty quickly. Um, mortality on its own from, from the virus, from everything that I see publishes ranges from like, you know, up to 90% of the flock, up to 100% of the flock. I mean, of course, it's always 100% because the response kills any survivors, but the actual disease, the virus can take out, you know, 90% of the flock pretty easily. Okay. Uh, let's see. Um, okay, here's a, a question that kind of goes back a couple slides, but do you know of the backyard, aka non-CAFO operations that went positive in 2015? What was their practice? proximity to CAFO operation. Um, so I guess, is there any, is there any association between uh, neighboring CAFO operations and other infection, infected operations? Yeah, the, um, that was part of the epide epidemiological report. Um, it's a good question. They, they did look at that. There is information. The short answer is not all of them, were in proximity to CAFOs, but a lot of them were. I remember doing a panel in Lancaster in 2015 with our state vet and PA and some of the extension folks. Um, and there was just, you know, some of the, some of the backyard actually had, you know, they worked on commercial farms. And so they brought their, they brought the virus out of the commercial farm into the backyard flock in, in just a couple cases. I'm not saying that's prevalent, but that was a couple of cases that they identified. Some of them were down, downwind of some exhaust fans. And, and even though it's primarily a contact-based transmission, you know, if you've got a high viral load, it, it's going to be in the air. And so the birds could shed it and then gets blown out through the exhaust and now it's airborne. Um, that's an actual risk identified in, in the reporting of 2015. So so there a fair number, I think, is the answer, but I'm not sure how many. Um, okay, maybe one more question right here. Um, if the, the flock is dispatched by the USDA, how long until I can replace my flock? Some logistics. 
yeah, you'll be, there's no blanket answer to that that I know of. Um, you'll be at the mercy of, of um, your, your federal and local officials to determine if it's safe for you to re restock with birds, you know, whatever, whatever safe means to them. You'll have to disinfect, you'll have to compost those birds typically. Um, you know, all that good stuff. So it'll be up to, it'll be up to them to, to give you the green light. Thank you. All right, so I'll go, I'll go ahead. Okay, so here's the, here's the questions we've always, we, we wanna drive at, right? How do you protect a flock? I'm gonna suggest to you at the ire of probably some of you listening that biosecurity is not your first line of defense. Um, you can throw tomatoes at me if you want. You can not invite me back, it's fine. I'm, I'm okay with it. But I'm gonna to suggest to you that biosecurity is not your primary uh, path here. Health of the bird is your, is your primary deterrent. Biosecurity is like the onion skins on an onion. They just layer on protection, right? It's kind of your last defense. Because I want you to ask, what happens when biosecurity fails, right? The, the commercial industry tells us what happens when biosecurity fails. They always tell us we need more of it and we need to do it better. But you know what? Biosecurity always fails. That's why we have outbreaks, right? If, if biosecurity was such a foolproof thing, we wouldn't have had it an outbreak in 2015 because we already had an outbreak, a big outbreak in the U.S. in the, in the 80s. And there's been other outbreaks throughout the world. And so we know that the virus is out there and it can wreak havoc on flocks. But yet we always promote biosecurity. And so we got to figure out what happens when it fails. This is a Congressional Research Service report. Um, again, coming off the heels of 2015, you can see the source of it here, um, a government report. I'll, I'll, there's two paragraphs, I'll, I'll read it. And we won't dwell on it because this, but besides wild birds shutting the AI virus, Avis found that HPI may have um, been through lax biosecurity measures, right? This could have spread through lax biosecurity. Uh, and they give some examples of what that bi lax biosecurity was. Avis also found that environmental factors could play a role as the virus was found in air samples that could be transmitted by wind to other farms. How do you buy security? That is a question you should ask. But, I mean, the industry will tell you, you yeah, put some filters on your ventilation fans and, and so on, right? Um, it's kind of like laws, right? No, in no, in no town or state that we live in, do, the, do we ever have less laws? Do people ever take laws away from us? They always add more. And so biosecurity is kind of the same way. There's, there's never a, a point where you say, we have all the, the biosecurity we need, we'll just take some off. No, it's always, we need more. Um, here's the second paragraph I wanted to, to, to read this. I should have bolded the first sentence here because it says scrupulous biosecurity practices may not fully protect against AI. Um, and it talks a little bit about what I did here. And here's the, here's the, under, the most important thing I think in this whole paragraph. One of the largest egg farms in Iowa received the perfect score on a USDA biosecurity audit two months before being infected with HPAI. So by all accounts, that farm was doing things right and proper, but they still became infected. Now, you don't hear this stuff bantered around by your extension office, by your, your state um, poultry folks, your, your state departments of, of ag. This is all buried in reports. This is a Congressional Research Service report breaking down some of the realities of the outbreak last time. But, but it's all informing a broader understanding of, of this. And I think that's important. So as we come into the end here, real quick, talk about this disease triangle. Um, you need, you have a host. This is your bird. How healthy is it? How susceptible? What's its immunity? Virus, how much of it? The environment, you know, ventilation temperature are important. Um, you, it's a combination of all these things that ultimately lead you to have problems or to 
to get sick, right? And you and in your chickens. So how do you how do you deal with this? Promote a healthy immune system in your flock. This comes off of I'm going to share a resource at the end of this that is our the APA's avian influenza resource center. But here's here's what we promoted in 2015. Here's what we promote in 2022. Here's what we'll promote next year and the year after that and the year after that. Feed the highest quality feed you possibly can. Maintain low stocking densities on pasture and in your winter housing. Right for, for pastured flocks right now, laying hens, that could be two square foot, three square foot or more. Um, when you're out on pasture, you know, that could be 20 square foot per bird in the in its range or something like that, right? In in a rotational setup. So Lots of space, low density. Um, ensure your feed is balanced for the species. This goes back to the feed. You can't have a healthy bird if you feed junky feed or if you take your feed nutrition and management for granted. Um, keep your brooder dry and your winter bedding dry. Um, you'll, you'll save on a lot of other uh, health issues. Keep your birds on fresh, clean pasture, if it is a pasture season, keep them rotated. Don't keep them in one spot where they're gonna denude and wear out the pasture. Um, incorporate natural sunlight into the environments and that maintain that low stress stocking density. That's, I think the numbers show us clearly that, that this is one of the main issues of, of our susceptibility in our flocks is, is high density stocking, both in barn and on farm. And so here's some biosecurity. So um, some things that also make sense. You know, this is a, a waterfowl-based disease or carrier or waterfowl are the primary vectors here, right? The, the primary culprits. So don't water your flocks out of ponds, right? If you have a pond on your farm, especially if it's been visited by the, the wild duck populations, it's not a good idea to let your chickens or your ducks or your turkeys or whatever else you have running around go and have unfettered access to that environment because you're putting them at risk, right? You have, you have high path AI that is transmitted via the feces of, of a duck and you're letting your birds go into that environment. You're, you're kind of asking for some, some challenges. Um, don't share equipment. This was one of the big challenges in 2015. And some of the commercial flocks found that, you know, lots of shared resources between these farms, um, people, live hauling trucks, feed delivery trucks, name it. But it, for us, for, for pastured folks, you know, this would be like chicken crates. You know, if you have chicken crates that you share with your neighbor, they better be clean. Um, wash them, clean them up. Don't, don't share equipment if you can help it. If you have to share equipment, make sure it's clean. Um, you might use dedicated boots for your chores that you don't wear into town or you don't wear into other farms. They, they stay with you and your farm and when you're doing chores. Um, you know, if you go into a commercial barn, they're going to make you put on booties and, and Tyvek suits and all that weird stuff. But we don't ne necessarily do that on pasture farms. I haven't met too many pasture farms that, that have boot washes or anything like that. But dedicated boots make sense, right? Uh, restrict the access of your feed trucks your delivery vehicles, things like that. Keep them in non-production areas of the farm. Um, you know, I source poultry from reliable sources. Uh, you know, very important to, to know who you're buying your poultry from uh, and whether or not they're monitoring for, for things like high path AI. Um, <laughs> our advice we wrote a few years ago, avoid poultry shows, fairs, and backyard flocks. Again, questionable. Sometimes for, you know, you don't know where these birds have been or what the, the husbandry or what the protocols are. And so sometimes it's, it's best just to avoid them altogether. Um, again, the resource here, you can see our resource center is linked as a source. I'm gonna, just, I have just a couple of slides and then we'll pause for some questions. And I got time to take as many questions as we have. Um, so I think the advantages for pastured flocks, low density, already stressed it enough. Independent decentralized farms, you know, if, if I have 5,000 birds on my farm right now because I'm, I'm in production season, 
I don't have 5,000, but if I did for as a, as a, just a random example, if, if my flock gets infected with, with AI, I'm a lone wolf, right? I'm independent. I don't have shared company resources. I'm, I'm by myself. So I can isolate myself. I'm, I'm at the risk of me spreading this out to other places is incredibly small compared to the contract grower model. Um, you may not like that assessment, but it's, it's true. It's, it's backed up by, by USDA's own reporting of the, of the facts. I shared that earlier. Um, flocks are set back off the road. Typically, there was, a, there was a analysis in the epidemiological report in July 15 of 2015 that showed that flocks being set off the road 100 yards was an advantage. I asked Dr. Wood when I talked to her why she thought that was, and her, her initial on the spot reaction was that, you know, in the, in the area that that survey was taking place that was heavily dense populated with poultry farms. And so a lot of them were, were by the road. And so there's a lot of traffic going up and down that potentially has other poultry traffic. But so being off of that thoroughfare, off of the road was a benefit. And so in, in a lot of times that's our environment as well. We have the advantage of being set back off the road um, clearly a hundred yards or more. And so that's, that's an advantage, I think. Seasonal concern, we already, we already discussed that. And there's the couple of resources. Um, the APA resource has some really good collection of information. It points to some specific USDA stuff as, as well as some stuff that we researched and wrote um, previous outbreaks and some other, some other cool stuff. Um, I guess questions, we'll finish up with some questions. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, let me just um, pull up my screen. Okay. So um, there are a couple questions that came in in the in the Q&A. And I'm also, well, I'm giving Mike a little breather and a chance to read through them. I'm going to pull up a quick poll for folks, if you wouldn't mind just um, as you're sitting here for the, for the last 10 minutes or so of our presentation. Um, just uh, to give us a little feedback about it. Um, so let me see here. Um, there's a question about, have you heard about me? Okay, so I think this was on your list actually, Mike, but what have you heard about major drop in water consumption as major sign of infection, major sign of infection? I don't know if, if the, this person is looking for a little bit more specifics or if you have um, anything else to share along those lines. Yeah, I think if you saw a major drop in your water consumption of your flock, you know, that's a signal that something's wrong. And so <clears throat> you would be looking very carefully at, at other, other signs. Um, and you'd, I think you'd have to consider uh, high path AI as one of those options, but um, it's very clearly a sign that you need to be aware of and be like, yeah, something's wrong and, and figure out why that is. Um, another question. Someone's saying that they have a ton of uh, Canada geese in their pastures. Um, is that a problem? Is there anything they can kind of proactively do <laughs> about having those those birds around? Yeah, that's interesting. Um, I don't know if they're out there while the birds, well, they have birds out there or not, but, um, you know, I, I would trust the model. I mean, if, assuming that you probably have birds that are actually this brings up a good point i want to talk about the biosecurity you know, sometimes the idea is to confine your birds chicken tractors actually do this really well right um, if you raise meat birds in a chicken tractor they're they're essentially confined in floorless tractors that you move across the pasture and so <clears throat> they're really a good aspect of, of biosecurity and if, if that was your situation you had with, with the Canada geese, I wouldn't worry about it at all. Um, if you had your, your layer flock or some heritage birds out there, potentially in a paddock, I would say um, giving them a, a place to range, like with fencing, like a dedicated paddock, instead of letting them roam all over, I would prefer that to just letting them, you know, have the broad access and, and hopefully that paddock you know, will separate the, the geese um, and, and make it less attractive for the geese to be in there. But um, which brings up another question that 
with birds generally out, you know, we are exposed to birds. You just can't avoid it in a pastured model, right? Um, it's, it's part of what you have to deal with. And so sometimes if you're worried, um, protecting the feed from, you know, from, I guess, airborne, airborne uh, problems like manure or dust or dirt or even birds eating it, you can feed inside your shelter or put a cover over top of your, your feeders and your water so that it stays protected against stuff like that, against incidental contacts from, from like droppings from above or something like that. Thank you. Uh, there's some discussion about, so it says, uh, I guess, where the infected flocks are located barn uh, backyard versus um, commercial flocks being in different parts of the country right now. I don't know if that's anything you would like to respond to. Yeah. Um, I mean, not the, the, the things are very clear. You can look at it on USDA's website. I mean, it's just the way it is. Um, I don't think that doesn't mean that. Remember what I said earlier. Um, hope maybe some people came in late, but I did say that as you have, if you have chickens, you have poultry, and you're dealing with a virus that attacks and affects, infects poultry, then you are at risk. Uh, it, it still doesn't change the fact of the risk model. I don't think when when I start seeing, when we start seeing outbreaks that are. 100% backyard flocks and there's no commercial flocks, then we can start having a conversation about where the real risk models are, um, in my opinion. But until, until that happens, I don't, even though we have some outbreaks in different parts of the country, it's, you know, I don't, I don't see the, I don't see the, um, the change in direction necessarily. So this came in uh, a question on the Q&A and I saw something somewhat related in the chat. Um, this one is, what about livestock guardian dogs moving between hens and other areas of the farm? Is this a risk? Are we being paranoid? Someone also asked in the in the chat just about, you know, rotational grazing, other animals, other, you know, non um, poultry related animals. Right. Um, what, what should folks keep in mind? So, you know, I, in the world that I live in, the producers that I that I work with um, through APA, they're not they're not worried about their dogs moving between their flocks. Um, they're not worried about the multi-species grazing aspect of this. Um, you know, biosecurity comes up in conversation with some of those folks on a routine basis. And there's there's two camps, and there's a well, there's three camps, right? There's the there's the one camp that says I'm not doing anything. I'm just, I trust my birds. I trust, I trust my, my, my management system. And I, I believe in it. And every, my, there's nothing in my flock that's off limits. Other people take the other extreme, follow the more conventional mindset and are really aggressive about biosecurity. And then there's people in the middle that implement the things that they can easily do. And I think that's, that's ultimately what this comes down to is making an informed decision about your risk. But I wouldn't be worried about your dogs or even multi-species grazing. We have time for just uh, for a couple more. Someone's asking, we have a single USDA broiler processor in our area <laughs> um, without knowing much else. Are, are they at risk of any, are they, are they at any significant risk of being shut down? Assuming, cause there's, you know, various birds coming into that <laughs> from different areas. Yeah, I think uh, the advantage there is everything comes out dead. So um, there's, there's not much of a, a, a risk to my to my knowledge, and I don't think you're at, there's really any risk of it being shut down. Okay, um, Sarah asked, "What if tractors? Uh, what if the tractor, the chicken tractor, I assume, is inadvertently put over droppings that are infected?" Yeah, I mean, so how long was the dropping there? Was it, you know, how how warm is it before before you went over top of it? Um, you know. I wouldn't be, you know, you play that game all day, what if, but I wouldn't be too worried about incidental contact. Okay. All right. 
getting down to the end of the list. Um, Mike emphasizes flock health. Is there any information on flock vigor health that looks at heritage breeds versus hybrid, high production varieties regardless? Do you find the breed, uh, that breed can have an impact on health in pastured flocks? Um, so there's a couple of layers to that question. Um, I, I'm a believer, like I, I do like heritage breeds, but I'm not, I'm not a snob about it. I do, I do uh, like to raise some of the other birds too, the commercial birds. Um, I, I believe that when you take the bird and you put it in a different system, i.e. out of a conventional model and into a pastured model, you change that bird, right? And we have some nutritional data that supports that. But you, you give that bird a different tra trajectory, immune, immunity, health, all that kind of stuff. So I, I believe that first and foremost. And I don't know that I've seen, I have seen some studies, like I said, there's, um, I have a, I have a, a PDF in my files from, I pulled up in 2015. I looked, I looked at Laos, I believe, some Asia outbreaks. Um, that was comparing the making an assertion against the genetic diversity of the of the flock and saying that that was an issue i haven't seen too much other stuff that suggests that i've i've had some conversations with another person within apa that that point actually two people that point back to that as being a potential issue um but yeah you're not going to find that research published by by a, our universities our extension or heaven forbid our commercial poultry industry. You'll never find that. Um, so it, it's a hard one to get answers to. Well, I'm just looking through. I think there's um, there's been a little bit of comments in the chat, but final question we have, what about pet birds? What are the protocols if it's on, found on property or someone owns them? So are we talking about pet chickens? or parakeets. I don't know anything <laughs> about parakeets. Um, <laughs> I am not sure. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure. I mean, the, the protocols, if you're dealing with, with high path AI, the, the protocols are very clear about oh, parakeets. <laughs> oh, parakeets, okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know, but the, the, um, the protocols are pretty clear with, with poultry. If it's, if it's HPI, it's you, you don't have control no matter whose property it's on. All right, well, let me just give um, a few housekeeping items uh, before we wrap up and sign off. Like I mentioned, uh, a recording of the webinar will be available. I'm gonna pass that around tomorrow, um, along with some links that Mike shared throughout. Um, they're going to be doc, um, archived on our YouTube channel and our website. Um, so keep an eye out for that email. We do have a few more webinars coming up uh, the winter into the spring. We'll probably have a couple more announced one later this week about how to um, run a meet CSA. So if that's something that you're looking to learn about, join us on Thursday. And I will send links to those uh, registration links in our the follow up email as well. So I afraid that this is uh, all the time we have for our talk today. Thank you, Mike, for being with us, taking the time, putting this together so quickly and um, sharing all that you know about this topic and that continues to evolve and <laughs> um, as, we learn, <laughs> as we learn more and get more information out there. But it seems like there are some pretty solid themes to go on. Um, and uh, I thank everyone out in the audience for your interest, your, you know, taking the time out from your day to be here and um, to, to learn more. Um, I hope that we'll be able to connect again soon. So thanks, everyone. Thanks, Mike. And I hope everyone has a good rest of your week if we don't talk. Great. Yeah, thanks, everyone. Thanks, Larissa. I appreciate uh, it. Yep. Yeah, bye-bye. <laughs>